Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to go to the next uh, part of the lecture where we talk about uh, theories of self. And I'm going to remember to blow this up a little bit. <clears throat> so, how we develop a sense of self. Uh, the most famous uh, theory of self is comes from Freud, which is a psychoanalytic uh, perspective and um, can involve uh, social psychology. And Freud looked at the self or the mind as being three interrelated parts. And he believed that these three interrelated parts work together. And the first part is this idea of the id. And the id is, I always think of as a way to remember it, as the kid. Um, and <coughs> The it is the part of us that wants what we want and wants it now, right? So the it is, uh, um, oh, here's a good picture. <laughs> this is point. <laughs> so the id wants uh, what we want and it wants it now, right? So the id is, I always think of toddlers. Toddlers are like pure id, right? They'll run around. Um, they whatever they pick up they put it in their mouth if you try and take it from them they hit you um, it's that part of us that uh, is just basic drive the part of us that uh, wants to drink wants to have sex wants to eat bad food um, so someone has come up with these pictures of Freud um, in the different states and the id is uh, the Joker right so it's just all the basic human drives so when we're born, we're basically all id. And the ego is us, right? The voice inside your head, the running narrative that talks about the world, that's the ego. And the ego is basically the I, right? It's the me. And as we grow and develop, we um, create and hopefully um, further grow something called the superego. And the superego is the conscience, and it's the ideal self. So it's the way we want to be, right? The, um, the way that we, that we should be, the way that we like to see ourselves. So a lot of our, and I don't know Batman well enough to know who this character is, so the, um, a lot of our lives is the battle between these three characters. Um, and there's lots of weird images of this, but here's, so here's a stereotypical way that we think about it. So you have the, the ego, the self here, the I, and then you have the id represented as the devil saying, you know, go ahead, do it. And you have the superego represented as the angel, right? And the angel saying, well, now think about it. Do you really want to do this? So one way to think about uh, this is to think about happen what happens when we get drunk, right? When people consume alcohol, right, the id gets bigger and bigger and the superego gets smaller and smaller, right? And we make worse and worse decisions, decisions that in the morning the I regrets, right? So we can make decisions that are not good based on um, choices that are prompted by the I, I mean by the id. So the id is the instincts, the ego is where we are, and the superego is morality. And then the self is kind of what happens when these things battle and have the choices that we make. And this is our kind of sense of self and who we are. And in different situations, we make different choices and different parts of us, um, depending on how we were raised and the different neuroses that we have, determine how it's my father-in-law's dog, um, determine how we uh, Misha, how we are as people. So you can see that's a very psychological sense of self, right? Because it's all happening internally. And when sociology, 
when sociology looks at the self and looks at how human beings develop a sense of self, we look a lot more closely at what happens outside and at how Misha and at how we develop a sense of self through our interactions with other people. So I was talking in the previous lecture about how this expression of need and whether or not it's met and that kind of interaction with human beings helps us learn about the world and whether or not it's a safe place and whether or not we're safe. And it also helps us develop a sense of who we are. And so our idea of self is dependent on our interactions with other people, that the sense of self does not exist in a vacuum, right? That it comes about from our interactions with other people. So Charles Cooley came up with this idea of what he called the looking glass self. And the looking glass uh, is an old fashioned word for a mirror. And he believed that your sense of self is determined from your perceptions of how other people see you and that it's based on a three-step process that we go through um, over and over and over again and we imagine how we appear to other people right not just how we look but how we appear in other ways and then we imagine how other people are judging us and how, what, how they are evaluating our presentation of self. And based on this, our sense of self is developed. So it doesn't really matter what people are actually thinking. It matters what we think they're thinking. Right? So there's a whole field of cognitive behavioral therapy that focuses on helping people um, kind of get a hold of their thoughts. Because one of the things that can happen um, in mental illness is that people can um, have uh, put a lot of weight, for example, on other people's views of them and have other people's opinions of them start to become their identity, right? So if someone feels negatively about me, um, that can start to have a significant impact on my sense of self based on Cooley's uh, theory that my sense of self is based on what I think others think about me. Um, and again, there's this field of psychology that helps people kind of battle that um, sense. And also that helps us understand that, you know, people are actually thinking about us a lot less than we think they are. And uh, they did this funny experiment where they had people, um, uh, college students um, go into a group setting and they had them wear a ridiculous t-shirt like like they would have a man go in um, wearing a Taylor Swift uh, t-shirt for example and the man would feel embarrassed and awkward and like everyone was judging him and thinking you know he was ridiculous and uh, and then after you know and they would go in and you know do something and then at the end they would ask people um, if they had noticed what he was wearing and most people had not so he was sure that everyone in the group was thinking you know what a loser he was and most people hadn't even noticed the t-shirt um, right much less had been thinking anything about him right people are not really as aware of us as we think they are um, so anyway, but of course, so according to Cooley, we go through this cycle all the time and then, um, this is how we develop and maintain our self-concept. And so our sense of self, again, is really rooted in our, um, interactions with other people. And so this ties into the concept of anime, um, which we'll be talking more about later. And anime is when people kind of drift away from society. And so you can see if you if you drift away from society and you're not really embedded with a social group or you don't have social connections, that you can start to kind of lose a sense of self. 
and um, this is often a precursor to deviance. Um, so one of the um, factors that's correlated with suicide, which we talked about in the very beginning, is uh, distance from social groups, so not having deep social ties. So um, one of the things that shows up in this sense of self is, you know, what are, how, when we're talking to our children and we're, uh, the way that we interact with them influences uh, the guys are here. They came today to start uh, uh, mulching or whatever they do, all that brush, brush from the tree. And uh, so the dogs have to let them know that that's their backyard. Um, so one of the ways that this can manifest is in what we say to our children. And what we say to our children impacts how they develop a sense of self. And one of the, um, some research that's done around this area has been about the issue of praise. And the issue of praise, um, I was at the, uh, I was at the um, health club yesterday, or what do you call it, ACAC, with my daughter and her friend, and I was sitting at a table, and this grandmother was there with her eight-year-old daughter who was on the swim team, and uh, she was saying to her daughter, her daughter didn't get a ribbon or, um, you know, something um, for the swim team, and she said to her daughter, you know, well, but you're a winner because um, you tried, right, and I thought that was a interesting word I'm not sure that's a word I would use with my daughter like a winner uh, because a winner when you when you tell your child they're a winner it implies that it's also possible to not be a winner right um, so you want to be careful about like research shows that when you praise children the way you praise them has an impact on how they frame the world so when you separate this idea of winners and losers then they can have uh, a sense of that there's a category and that they might fall into the other one. What she did do that research has shown is helpful for children is that she praised, oh my God, I'm almost done, is that she praised her granddaughter's effort. And one of the things that we know is helpful is that instead of praising results or talent, <laughs> instead of praising results or talent, Aisha, instead of praising results or talent with a child, um, that we should praise effort, right? Because talent is not something children can control, right? Talent is something that you're born with. Right? People are born with a knack for sports or um, instruments. You know, we have this kind of innate talent. But effort is something you can control. So we find that um, if we praise children too much um, for things they can't control, or if we praise them just too much in general, then they can become dependent on external praise instead of internal motivation. Um, so now they've started the wood chipper and the dog's going insane. So I'm gonna stop. You know, this is just not my term. Um, so that's the end of video two.